I don't know who schedules these things, but um, I, uh, I always have to follow Bob. It doesn't, it doesn't seem fair. But, uh, <clears throat> so in my talk, I'm going to come uh, down a level to uh, just uh, mundane economics, as Joe Slerna likes to talk about it. Uh, but first, I'd like to uh, thank the sponsor of uh, my lecture, uh, Sean Sadler, uh, for his uh, generosity. And uh, of course, uh, the generosity of all our donors who have uh, made this uh, great conference possible. <clears throat> I'm going to start with the premise that uh, all economists of goodwill uh, try to explain uh, the facts that are generated by economic activity. And by this, I want to concentrate uh, not on some of the things that have been discussed, but what I'm uh, referring to are real world facts the concrete facts of actual uh, human action in real life. And economists of all different uh, schools of thought do this um, uh, in, in, uh, in, in uh, two different uh, venues, if you want to say it that way. One is to have conceptual understanding. So almost all economists, again, of goodwill, um, desire to understand the cause and effect structure that's generating the, these, these facts of, uh, that, that result from human action. We could call this now, for our purposes, economic theory. And, and then secondly, um, economists want to predict the emerging real facts of the world that will come about under some conditions that have not yet been taken uh, in human action. Uh, public policy, of course, being an obvious uh, example of this. <clears throat> and uh, just as a caveat again here, I want to point out that uh, I, uh, I'm not going to talk about what Joe Salerno discussed before about pattern prediction. I'm not talking about that element. This, this I'll just call applied economics. Uh, I want to focus on economic history, the actual concrete activity of uh, persons in real life, right, that have been taken uh, in the past. And as uh, I think it was Hans Hoppe said in his talk, uh, also to um, uh, the, the entrepreneur is the person who, who uh, gives us a, uh, uh, an economic history of facts yet to come, right? So prediction in that sense, this is what I'm speaking about. Now, it's true that different schools of economic thought con conceive of the relationship between theory and facts uh, quite differently. And in, in my talk, I want to uh, canvas some of that. And I want to show that, um, that the mangarian Misesian approach to uh, economics is uh, superior to these other approaches in uh, putting together the, the package of, uh, of conceptual understanding with, uh, with prediction. <coughs> um, of real world facts. One thing though that all uh, economists again of goodwill um, agree upon, uh, whether they think about this very carefully or not, is that your theoretical conception circumscribes the way in which you uh, engage with the facts. So the theory that you have is uh, restrictive of how you think about the facts of the world. Let me give you just a, a simple illustration of this, and then this will be the, the gateway to, to uh, the rest of my talk. We're all familiar with the uh, uh, Schumpeter's uh, uh, remark about the British classical school uh, shunting economics onto the wrong path by ignoring uh, the uh, demand side of markets, right, and concentrating just on the businessman's uh, calculation of uh, costs and you know, maximizing profit and so on and so forth. So we get this uh, uh, theoretical orientation in Adam Smith where the whole uh, thrust of price theory is explained by the theory that um, businessmen are uh, bringing about these prices through monetary calculation, as we would call it, right? Just to the calculation of monetary costs and then revenues. And sure, sure, in the short run, demands could push the, the revenue stream up and then you would get profit, but then other entrepreneurs, right, would enter into the market and we'd 
push the price right back down to the cost of production um, th through this entrepreneurial or businessman's uh, activity. And there was no real uh, robust role then for subjective valuation in the British classical conception. And we see that you know, this is pressed, of course, by, by Ricardo in the labor theory of value. And then Marx, I just, it's sort of, how do they interpret the facts of, of markets? Well, they, th their theory is sort of pressing them to this, to this uh, logical position that they take. And, uh, and so I think this is a general principle that we'll see in some of these other schools of thought. Now, when the marginalist revolution came in uh, 1871 to correct this, it introduced, of course, the, um, the consumer as, as a, oh, well, maybe we call it equal element, equal partner in determining uh, prices, or it needed to be integrated at least into the cost of production side of things, right? <clears throat> and, and here, too, there, there's this... Um, uh, acceptance of the fact that we as consumers, and then of course as household earning income and so on, we too take into account monetary factors, right? Uh, I think uh, Paul Swick talked about uh, you know maximizing income and uh, so on, and, and choosing jobs and things like this, and we pay attention to the prices of things and uh, so on and so forth. But it, but it was the it was the element of subjective value that, that the consumer bases decisions about buying and taking jobs and so on and so forth uh, through, the, through human judgment, we could call it, right? Through just subjective determinations and not just monetary concerns. <clears throat> now, by introducing this element, economics came to a crossroads. And one path on, this, uh, on, on these crossing roads was the Mengarian and then Misesian path. And in this path, as we've heard uh, several times explained, uh, they set out on the what uh, Joe Salerno again likes to call the causal realist uh, approach, or what Mises would later call praxeology, which begins with reflectively understood facts about human nature and human action. So these are real facts of the world, right, that uh, this approach begins with. And one of these real facts is that human uh, action, that choices are based upon human judgment and therefore are personal. Uh, they can't be explained, as uh, Bob Murphy just uh, went through, uh, entirely by external factors about costs and incomes and profits and uh, so on and so forth. But there is some, there's some uh, human element here that has to be incorporated at the very beginning of economic theory. Uh, and, and this, by the way, if this, uh, as, the, uh, as this method unfolds, uh, we, we see that this is uh, extended to all actors because what Mises does, of course, first of all, in human action is give us a theory of what we might call personal action, the action of each person, right? Crusoe economics is a, as an archetype of this, but he, he's really explaining the action of you or me theoretically. So it's not just consumers that have a subjective element to their action. We as producers do, taking jobs, we do this, right? And the entrepreneurs do too. And so we, we, this is inescapable. We can't reduce the market activity and our explanation of the facts of, uh, uh, of economic action just down to calculable things, right? <clears throat> well, once we have this, then, then the next step is to, is to insert into the um, uh, analysis, once we understand each person's action, the uh, other sort of general empirical facts or facts that we can discover about the world uh, that are uh, not easy to contest about the heterogeneity of persons. We differ from each other. The heterogeneity of land sites or natural resources, right? They're not all the same. They're uh, important differences between them. Uh, capital goods are heterogeneous. And not, we don't have schmoo capital, right? We've got, we've got um, uh, variations, and, and therefore this needs to be taken into account when we get to the uh, theory of uh, social life. And again, uh, Paul Swick uh, you know, explained how this works with the uh, uh, law of association. <clears throat> this is then the science of society. And once we have the praxeology, the science of social life, 
uh, we can engage in, as Joe Salerno explained, in pattern predictions, which are within the scope of science. <clears throat> but if we want to explain the concrete uh, facts of uh, actual human life in history, we have to take the next step uh, methodologically uh, that uh, Mises uh, works out in his book, uh, Theory and History, which is what he calls thymology. We have to understand, in other words, the process, the, the uh, um, truth, the path to truth in understanding how to integrate uh, our knowledge that we gain just by empirical observation about the concrete facts of human action in the past, or if we're predicting what we think facts will emerge into the future, uh, within, within the uh, restraint or within the framework of praxeological economic theory. So you see praxeology provides a, a, a constraint on the way in which we can understand the real facts the actual concrete facts of, uh, of human life. <clears throat> so with thymology, notice, once again, we have an element of human judgment that is necessary. This was Mises's point, right? That uh, uh, his emphasis was on the fact that uh, when, when we're trying to figure out how important, um, um, you know, uh, Roosevelt's, um, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's um, decision was on, um, uh, revaluing uh, gold after he confiscated uh, American gold. How, how important this fact was in the golden avalanche that uh, came into the U.S. and then you know, disturbed the uh, international uh, economy. Uh, we, we have to be able to uh, grasp through human, human judgment the relevance of this episode. How relevant is it compared to, let's say, bank failures or compared to other uh, causal factors that are intertwined to bring about the, the actual real facts that we, that we see in history. This is thymology. <clears throat> now, the other path that was uh, taken um, uh, in, uh, uh, in the wake of the Marginalist Revolution, of course, was the neoclassical. And the neoclassical path uh, rejects out of hand praxeology and instead has adopted uh, a modeling approach <clears throat> and in this modeling approach, they're, they're trying to be scientific. And it seems uh, one way of thinking about this is the, the way in which they conceive of science or, or one element that they uh, press is that there can be no human judgment, or at least human judgment has to be minimized to the greatest possible extent possible, right? We have to eliminate all human judgment that we can. Oh, maybe there are things on the edge where we can't quite get rid of it all. You know, we are, you know, even scientists are human beings. And so they, by necessity, have to make judgments and so on. But we're, we're going to eliminate all elements that are based upon human judgment. And this, of course, is why they formalize in a model uh, utility functions because then you get rid of personal judgment, right? You, you specify exactly how the agents are gonna behave under certain external conditions. They're just, they're just responding to these external conditions, right? They're not human beings anymore. If they're random elements and you know, stochastic elements in the model, well, this is just all gonna be treated in, in, uh, with statistical analysis. Is there gonna be any human judgment uh, like uh, you know, it was talked about in earlier lectures about case probability and entrepreneurial you know, assessment and, and so on of the conditions, all of that ha is out the window, right? If, if there's any realistic element to these models, it's inserted by assumption into the model at various steps. You know, you have an economic agent and then you have uh, action of the agent and you, know, you have conditions under which the agent acts and you can, you can you can insert various realistic elements into this to restrain the result that you get, right? The, the, the framework you get will be different depending on how you configure these different assumptions that are uh, attempting to get some sort of connection between your abstract uh, concepts and the actual facts of the real world that you're trying to explain. And we'll see again, uh, well, in the paper, I won't get through all of this uh, here, but in the paper, you'll see uh, uh, how I've uh, done this, I've applied this uh, approach to, to the various uh, stages of development of modeling in macroeconomics. 
uh, since the uh, days of uh, Keynes. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> uh, my conclusion on all of this, just to give you the bottom line, because again, I won't get through every step uh, in the talk, is that um, mainstream modeling in macroeconomics has not been a way forward. The, the modeling uh, uh, change, you know, the changes in the organization of the models that's occurred in macroeconomics has not given us a, a whig uh, upward and onward into the light uh, process. It's given us at best a, uh, maybe it's not an anti-whig, but it's, uh, you know, it's just, it's not making progress. It's uh, floundering maybe between, between one, set of problems that are created by the particular model, and then that problem is solved by introducing a new model, which then raises other questions and problems, and then that one's overturned by another model, and, uh, and every, every one is overturned by the inability of the model at the, at the moment it's rejected of predicting the actual real facts that occur in the world. <clears throat> So let's start. Uh, I'll get through a few of these to give you a flavor of uh, uh, what, what, uh, what's covered in the paper. So let's start with the so-called uh, neoclassical synthesis. This is um, encompassed largely in the, in the model of uh, uh, J.R. Hicks, which uh, all, of, all of us who've studied economics formally know is the ISLM model. Right? And uh, this model doesn't talk about individual agents. It, it starts at the, at the level of markets, right? And makes certain assumptions about how they work and so on and so forth. And then you have you know, a set of equations and, and what have you that can be solved for the, for the uh, uh, variables in the model. And then you're trying to explain, you know, not, not, uh, not historical facts in the, in the basic sense, but you're trying to explain facts that have been aggregated statistical facts, right? <clears throat> like a GDP, not, not individual production processes and prices and so on, but GDP. <clears throat> now, th this, uh, even though this is called the synthesis, it really wasn't a synthesis. It was, it was a kind of an uneasy compromise between two different approaches in economics that had been competing or been part of the neoclassical tradition since the marginalist revolution, one from Valra, which was a uh, general equilibrium uh, conception, uh, theoretically, and one, one that uh, came from Jevons, but then more famously with Marshall, right, which was partial equilibrium. And so, so this kind of uneasy compromise between the two, it's hard to see how you can reconcile the two of them, led to these, uh, led to these problems that eventually uh, led to the demise of the, of the um, uh, neoclassical synthesis uh, uh, project. <clears throat> One of these was there were no microeconomic foundations, as I mentioned already, so-called, for the ISLM model. It was, it was already aggregated, right? It, was, it wasn't linked to individual agents and their activity. <clears throat> also, it retained the, the Keynesian disequilibrium uh, aspect of thinking about markets with the uh, Valrasian uh, equilibrium idea. So how, how do you reconcile these two, right? The short run, the long run. and it, it also had the tension between a dynamic process of economic activity over time and static notions of, of uh, equilibrium states, right? And none of these problems, even though there were tremendous efforts that were made by brilliant economists to try to resolve all these, all these problems uh, were solved within, within this, uh, this paradigm. The Mengarian Misesian approach, though, had solved all of these problems even before the neoclassical synthesis arrived on the scene. The micro-macro uh, uh, gap was, uh, was solved in the Mengarian tradition, first by uh, Bumbavork's uh, famous uh, conception of the capital structure. And as uh, Sean Rittenauer was explaining to us, capital structure is, the, is a key Austrian element in, in explaining both uh, economic growth and then uh, business cycles, again, as Paul Swick was talking about. Because, because it shows us that the, that the macro economy is just a 
sequence of production processes from the extraction of raw materials down through the production of variable capital goods, combining at each step, and then eventually producing consumer goods. <clears throat> and, and because we have this structure, we can see exactly, depending on the problem that we want to address in thinking about the economy, we can see exactly how to aggregate things. Aggregate by industry, we can aggregate by uh, you know, uh, uh, the full economy, you know, aggregate all the consumer goods, if we we're looking at that issue or what have you. <clears throat> so so th there, is no, uh, there is no conceptual difficulty here. The other thing that, uh, the other insight uh, came from Mises that uh, bridged this gap between micro and macro. And, and that was, of course, his uh, integration of um, the theory of money into the subjective value theory. Of, of price, right, where he showed that the purchasing power of money is determined in the same way as the purchasing power of any good uh, by the stock of the good and the demand to possess the good, in this case money, as an asset or, or you know, to own it as a good. Uh, and, and you'll remember again that Mises, uh, Bumbavrk does this too, but M Mises explicitly begins this analysis with preference, with the preference of real people pointing out that in, when we go out into the world, into a market economy and buy something, we're, uh, we're establishing a preference between a sum of money and units of the good. And if the units of the good we prefer to the sum of money, we're buying, and if not, we're not buying. Or if we own the good and the money is preferred that we could obtain by selling the good is preferred to retaining the good, we would sell the good. So he starts with the, at the very beginning, right, at the, at the ground level with human action. And he builds out this, this theory that reconciles then the monetary and the real economy, as neoclassical economists would, would put it, right? And then once, once, once this development occurs, then the Mises progresses to the theory of economic calculation that you've heard much about, uh, by which he can then explain uh, appraisement, as we uh, just uh, uh, heard from uh, Bob Murphy. He can explain the appraisement decisions of entrepreneurs in anticipating what will generate uh, monetary uh, gain through uh, acquiring inputs and paying input prices and then producing a good and selling the goods sometime in the future and obtaining uh, revenue and can direct resources efficiently into production processes and capital investment into uh, different lines of uh, assets. And then from here, uh, the Austrian economist, Mises in particular, builds out uh, the theory both of economic growth, uh, again, that Dr. Rittenauer explained for us, and, uh, and the business cycle. So the whole, the whole apparatus of uh, macroeconomics is built from individual behavior. And this isn't individual behavior in some weird agency sense, but individual behavior in the uh, normal sense that we are undertaking action that we experience in the real world, buying things, selling things, taking jobs, right, uh, uh, earning income, and, and uh, so on and so forth. <clears throat> now, the demise of the neoclassical synthesis, though, did not, did not rely just on the theoretical difficulties that were b brought up, uh, you know, uh, to... Uh, uh, for the uh, neoclassical economists to struggle with. It, it wasn't that they couldn't resolve these difficulties. That wasn't the main thing that led to its demise. The main thing was the stagflation of the 1970s. The models could not predict, did not predict, the stagflation of the 1970s. And if they don't predict, they're out, right? And something's going to replace them. And what replaced them was the new classical modeling of Lucas and Sargent. And new classical modeling then shifted the orientation of theory away from the, the, this Keynesian uh, emphasis uh, toward, toward the Walrasian general equilibrium um, paradigm. And Lucas and Sargent showed that it is possible, if you make certain assumptions, it is possible to, to assume the, the Keynesian kind of uh, disturbances that we want to explain, these are real things, right? You want to explain the Great Depression, the unemployment and the stock market crash. You want to explain these real things. These disturbances can be explained within the general equilibrium framework. <clears throat> uh, within their framework, of course, there are certain stipulations, right? The agents uh, or representative agent of the model is rational. 
Markets are continuously clearing. Uh, and by this, of course, what they mean is not just that uh, the way the Austrians understand markets clearing, right? You have people and they come together and trade and then they separate once the market clears. But, uh, but by clearing, they mean all, all possible adjustments that need to take place in order to reach what Mises would call the final state of rest are taken in advance of any actual trade. And this is guaranteed by the Valrasian auctioneer who figures out exactly what the demands and supplies are in every market before allowing any trade to take place at all. So all the agents are forward looking and they can anticipate how everything's gonna work out. And so they can withhold their actual trades until, until uh, you know, that, that process is uh, undertaken. <clears throat> so uh, uh, how do you get a business cycle uh, in, in this model well, Lucas and Sargent say, well, we can just, uh, we can just uh, assume that there's something like unanticipated shocks. There's something, there's something external to, to this equilibrium process, or at least external to the agent's uh, purview. And, and for Lucas, at least, this included both monetary shocks, interesting, because again, you know, he wants to explain the real world, right? It seems hard to do without some kind of monetary element, explain the Great Depression, stock market crashes and so on, uh, deflation and what have you. Uh, and techno technological shocks, both of these included. <clears throat> and so this is where we get the rise of uh, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models as, a, as the standard approach in uh, macroeconomics. <clears throat> now, the other, the other uh, I'll mention one other thing that led to the uh, um, uh, acceptance of this by uh, neoclassical economists. There were two major things, right? One is it, it, uh, it gave an internally consistent theory. And so then they no longer had to deal with this, with this uh, inconsistency between the Keynesian short-run disequilibrium and the Valrasian long-run uh, general equilibrium. But more important than that, Lucas uh, showed very famously that econometric testing of, of these neoclassical synthesis models is completely useless in the face of policy initiatives. Because anytime policy is initiated into the model, the agents of the model or the structure of the model changes. And therefore, you don't have any constants in the parameters of the model moving forward as policy changes occur. <clears throat> and so, oops. Uh, well, if we can't do policy analysis, maybe we ought, you know, in our old system, maybe we ought to adopt this new system, right? Now, let me, let me just mention the, the uh, 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 Misesian response to, to, uh, to this, just to show you again that all along the way, the issues that arise are already solved or uh, latently solved, at least within Mises' uh, human action. Uh, uh, we've already spoken about how uh, Mises' conception of the human person already, already entails genuine uncertainty of the future. So we as human beings really are forward-looking. Human action is always forward-looking. And so we don't need some sort of special assumption about how agents are forward-looking, right? What it means for them to be forward-looking. We understand this just as, as human beings. <clears throat> when we anticipate the future, we use personal judgment. So once again, he, uh, Mises is just saying, look, we, we're going to start with realistic uh, facts about human nature. We know then that different different persons will anticipate differently. And so we're gonna get this spectrum of expectations, which can then explain how we get a spectrum of results among different entrepreneurs, you know, uh, facing the same sort of industrial situations in the market. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, Mises actually, in my judgment, at least one-ups Lucas on this policy question, because what Mises argues is that when there's a, uh, if you wanna do econometric testing, any circumstance that changes, that unexpectedly changes people's behavior is gonna change the parameters of the model. It, it isn't just policy, it's anything that, that, that might occur that people don't fully take into account through this auctioneering process, right, and adapt to in advance. And therefore, he, he didn't find much usefulness for uh, understanding um, uh, real, human, you, real human action and predicting real human action from from uh, econometric uh, analysis. So I'll stop at this point. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
Thank you.